So uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers of the seminar, especially Marco, for inviting me uh, to speak here. It's a pleasure to visit. And uh, so I'm going to tell you about some uh, work I've been doing over the past uh, few years on uh, how we can understand proteins based on physics. And uh, I currently work at Laboratoire Jean Perrin of CNRS and Sorbonne University in Paris, so quite close to here. Um, and uh, proteins can be described at several different levels. And fundamentally, they are heteropolymers of amino acids, and they are fully uh, determined by the sequence of amino acids uh, um, that, they, that they are constituted with. And this sequence fully defines their 3D structure and their function, which is their biological role in the cell. However, something that is a bit uh, perhaps less frequently mentioned is that the structure and function in turn impose constraints on the sequences that can exist and that can survive natural selection. Because in fact, while mutations in evolution affect directly the sequence, the what matters as a f a for, for the role of the proteins is the function, and the structure is often very important for the function. So mutations are selected on the basis of their impact on the structure and the function. Because of this, the proteins that we actually observe in living organisms have uh, sequences that are strongly constrained by the structure and the function. And currently, there is a growing amount of sequence data that is available. Here, you can see the number of sequences in time. So this plot is a bit old, but the growth has continued to this day. And currently, th there is more than 10 to the 8 sequences. But most of them are unannotated, which means that we do not know much about them. Here, in fact, you have in green the plot for the annotated sequences, so those for which we have some idea of the function. And in red, you have those for which we know the 3D structure from experiments, for instance, X-ray crystallography. You see that they are far smaller and they, they, they grow far less fast. And this means that we are facing this huge amount of unannotated data. And this is a great opportunity for statistical physics and information theory-based methods to learn about proteins from sequences. So this is a field that is currently growing. And I'm going to present a very uh, personal view of, uh, of, of some direction that I have contributed to. So the first one is going to be about inferring interaction partners from protein sequences. I will present two different methods, which are based on different uh, types of inference. The first one is maximum entropy, and the second one is mutual information. And uh, finally, I will also tell you about the role of correlations from the evolutionary history of the proteins. And uh, then I will also have a shorter part, which is on how we can make sense of the collectively correlated groups of amino acids in protein sequences. So first, let me tell you a bit about protein-protein interactions. Here you have uh, a figure from an experimental paper. Uh, which shows you the network of protein-protein interactions in Escherichia coli. And the colors um, give you some information about which of these interactions are known and not known. And in fact, there are sometimes disagreements between previous measurements on those in this paper, which in fact shows that even for these very well-known model organisms and with these great new experimental methods, we don't have a full knowledge of this protein-protein interaction network. And you can imagine that for other species, it's even worse. And you know, like determining the, all the possible interactions in one, um, in one species is really a very high, high throughput question. And it's very hard from an experimental point of view. It's hard to have very uh, precise results. Because of this, it's an exciting um, prospect to be able to find out about these interactions from sequence data. And this can help us to understand the cell as a system, to understand which proteins interact with which one, which can be important for the formation of multiprotein complexes, which, is, you know, which are often the units that have a function. And it can also be important for the signal transduction in pathways in the cell. So there are fundamental questions. And there are also some applications. For instance, if you want to target a drug to a specific pathway, you don't want to target it to some, some other pathway that resembles it. So for this, you need to know the specific interactions. So OK. So, um, for this, we can try to use the sequence data. And at the basis of you know, all these varieties of methods which have been introduced, there is the fact that um, if two proteins interact together, they have to uh, have some physicochemical complementarity on some amino acids. 
For instance, you may imagine an electrostatic charge point where this one is uh, positively charged and this one is negatively charged, and this enables them to interact. But during the course of evolution, you may have a mutation that affects this particular amino acid, in which case it will lose its complementarity to the other one, which will be bad for the interaction. Here I'm representing a very simplified case where the interaction relies only on one pair, and so it's lost when the complementary is lost. In reality, the interfaces are, much are larger, so here they are colored on these real 3D structures. But nevertheless, the argument stays the same. You are impairing in some way the interaction. It works less well. However, this interaction can be restored if you have a complementary mutation that occurs on the other amino acid. So natural selection is going to select these two states and to eliminate this one because it no longer interacts properly and therefore the protein complex no longer performs its function properly, which is by bad for the fitness of the cell. Because of this, when you observe the sequences of proteins that actually interact together, so these are actual partners from the families, so what we call a protein family is a set of proteins that have the same ancestor, that have a similar function and a similar structure. And uh, here we imagine that we know that this A interacts with this B, this other A interacts with this other B, and they may be in different species. Maybe this one is a, uh, one bacteria, this one in another bacteria, or one is a human protein, another one is a chimpan chimpanzee protein. Okay, so anyway, we have these proteins that do interact together. And um, in fact, the, the fact that they need to have complementarity on these amino acids will result in a correlation of uh, these two sites on the sequence. So in my simplified example, if you have a red amino acid here, you have a red one here. If you have a green one here, you have a green one here. Um, OK, so if we have an interaction, we have a correlation. And then it means that we can ask the inverse problem, uh, whether we can employ the patterns of correlations in order to infer which proteins interact together. And I'm going to ask, in fact, two questions here. The first one is if I take two families of proteins, so the set of A's and the set of B's, can we say whether A and B interact together or not? And the second one is if I already know that at least in some species A and B interact together, can I find specifically in each species which A interacts with which B? And this question arises because in each species there are often multiple copies of A and multiple copies of B which are slightly different but which will have you know, similar functions but not exactly the same function. And in, in you know, if you really want to understand the pathways, you want to know which particular A interacts with which particular B. OK, so these are the type of questions. And um, so there are many ways to address these questions, many ways to exploit these correlations. Um, there are, in the literature, some works which have employed uh, phylogeny-based strategies, other Bayesian tree strategies. I'm going to focus on the stuff um, I've been participating in, which is uh, first a method based on maximum entropy inference. Um, and so this method um, relies on, uh, okay, so here I call it DCA, which means direct coupling analysis. It's an acronym which, you know, is, uh, has been used in the field of protein f to, dis to um, cover these maximum entropy strategies, which were used um, to infer structure from sequences before they are used now for to infer interactions from sequences. I will come back on this later. I just wanted to define this uh, um, abbreviation. And so um, we may have a, a training set of pairs of uh, A and B. So these are the ones, for instance, that are known from experiments. An experiment has given you the result that in some species you have this A that interacts with this B, and you have the sequences. In this case, if you do have a training set, you start from it and you uh, write the sequences. So this is a sequence of your first A with the sequence of its partner B. And you make a long sequence out of it because you are going to want to focus on the correlations you know, between these two things. So you make a long sequence. And then you make another concatenated sequence out of the next A with its partner B. So these are the known pairs. From the known pairs, you uh, estimate the correlations. And then by using maximum entropy inference, you can infer direct couplings and calculate effective interaction energies based on the statistical model. And then what we do is that we use these interaction energies in order to predict which other pairs are more likely to interact together in the data set, just by saying that those that have the lowest interaction energy 
are more likely to interact than the other ones. We also use the energy gap in order to give a confidence score to the pairs that we predict. And then the, those pairs that have the highest confidence score are used uh, and incorporated into the concatenated alignment, which then grows. And the idea is that we uh, have more and more information into this alignment, and we rebuild the model. And hopefully, the model is going to improve because we add information. So it's really an iterative process. And overall, the aim is to approximately minimize the effective interaction energies between the partners. This was really a very fast overview. So now I'm going to give you a bit more details on this part. So um, yes, sure, question. So OK, so you are asking the question about the structure, and it's a very relevant question. Here I'm rather you know, asking the question about who interacts with whom, ah, okay. which is a bit different. But you are completely right. Huh? Because in fact, the, the, the model is going to inform us also about the points of interactions. And you are right that if you use these concatenated sequences, you can uh, find contacts between the two proteins. This is perfectly correct, yes. yes. OK, so here, um, let's say that this is our uh, concatenated alignment for, from the training set, so the pairs that we know. And uh, what we do is just that we uh, measure the one body and two body frequencies in this alignment. Uh, that is to say, for each site i, we count how many times we observe the amino acid alpha. So alpha is one of the 20 natural amino acids or the alignment gap. So there are 21 states here for each site. And uh, we count, for instance, how many times we observe histidine at the third site, alanine at the last one. These are, you know, just counting. OK. So we, we count also the occurrence of pairs. Uh, so how many times do I observe histidine at the third and alanine at the last, etc. And then we can calculate the correlations just by making this subtraction. And then we build a pairwise maximum entropy model um, starting from these uh, one and two body frequencies. So we, we build the least structured distribution, uh, L body distribution of probabilities that matches the observed one and two body frequencies from the data. So when you uh, do this uh, maximization of the entropy, so you, know, you write the minus uh, sum of p log p, you maximize it under the constraints that it has to match these one and two body frequencies, you, you obtain this form for the pairwise maximum entropy, which is very uh, familiar for physicists because it looks like the Boltzmann distribution of a, pol a POTS model where you have here one body terms, which are the fields, and two body terms, which are couplings. Um, so this is, in fact, a classical result of inverse statistical physics. And this kind of approach is used in many other fields, for instance, in neuroscience, but you know, also many other ones. Uh, there is, for instance, a review by Simona Coco and colleague, uh, colleagues about this. Um, and here, um, I would like to mention that this problem, once we have written the nice form of the distribution, is still a very hard problem because we have to figure out exactly what values of the fields and of the couplings we should take in order to match the one and two body frequencies. This is a hard problem. There are approximations which have been developed. And here I'm going to remain with the simplest approximation, which is the approximation of small couplings, uh, mean field approximation. So you just uh, you can find it by, t by assuming that the couplings are small, putting epsilon here to the first order term. And you find that the couplings are just the elements of the inverse matrix of correlations. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, OK. Maybe I was not clear, but I meant that if you want to find the exact solution, it's very difficult. This is an approximation. Oh. Yes. So the approximation, as you say, is easy. But it's just an approximation. So you know, it will, it will hold only if the EIJs are very small, which is not really, really the case. So, you know. But in this framework, you're right. It's easy. We can go with it. So in fact, it turns out that in proteins, this approximation is sufficient. I mean, at least it's pretty good. It has been very successful, in fact, at predicting structures from sequences. So this has been done in these seminar, seminal papers, uh, this one from Martin Weix and colleagues in 2009, et cetera. And then uh, these two papers actually found 3D structures of proteins um, completely. Like they, they predicted uh, PDB-like 
uh, positions of atoms just from the set of homologous sequences. Um, OK, so let's say this is a, like a way to solve the folding problem, starting not from one protein, but from an alignment of homologous proteins. Why is it that for this alignment we need thousands of sequences? So why do we need? OK, so I would say that uh, we need to properly measure all these correlations. And you, you know. So you the problem is in measuring the experimental correlation yeah. and not in the model? Are so we sure of that? OK, that's a, that's a fair point. I mean, like I, I would say that the limiting thing is mostly like the reason why it works for alignments of thousands of, of sequences and not for alignments of 50 or something is because we don't have enough information about the correlations when we have 50 sequences. You, in fact, the number is important, but also the diversity. If you have a super conserved protein, then you know, maybe you have 1,000 sequences, but they are too similar to be able to properly measure correlations. So, like you need to have lots of proteins and uh, enough diversity. This is a, this is a definitely a limiting factor. You are right to say that the model is imperfect. Like the, <coughs> the choice here that is made is to assume that we we stop at the two body frequencies. In fact, there may be three body interactions. But so you know, these models have been pretty successful. But of course, it doesn't mean that they are completely fundamentally correct. Like there may be higher order interactions that matter. However, in order to measure them properly, we would need even higher order correlations, which is even more of a problem given the data. So, yeah. Also, I mean, maximum entropy is an assumption. Like we say, we want the distribution with the least structured, like the least structured distribution from the data that is consistent with these one and two body frequencies. But in fact, there is some underlying structure in the data, phylogeny, etc. So, you know. Because of phylogeny, yeah. Not only, I, mean, I don't know, but mm -hmm. there is a, what is the homology between the two? Okay, so yeah, I mean, homology search is a field that is quite uh, interesting per se. Here we assume that the homology problem is solved. So we take, we take sets of uh, sequences so that are. Is the homology between, between the two? Yeah. Right, so I mean, I think uh, here they have, uh, uh, like, in, for instance, in the kinase and response regulator, they often often have up to like 60% difference, which is quite big. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, they are not, you know, not too similar, but I mean, still, among them, there are many that are, like, there are pairs that are pretty similar. We take some pragmatic uh, view in the field, like, uh, of downweighting the sequences that are too similar. For instance, if you have two very close neighbors, you will give them a weight one half to each so that you keep the information from both of them, but you don't weigh them equally to some that is very far away. But this is pragmatic. I mean, I think ideally you would have to take into account the tree and everything, but for now, you know, this is the state. Uh. Okay, so these are, you know, these are relevant, relevant points for sure. All right, so um, let's say that we have our approximation to the couplings here. The uh, EIJ is in the mean field approximation. Using them, we can attribute a score to each pair within each species. So the pair A1, B1, for instance, A1, B2, etc. We can give them a score, which is the effective interaction energies, by summing the appropriate two-body interaction terms. So the appropriate EIJs with the, the correct uh, amino acid identities here. And uh, we use this e effective interaction energy in order to score the pairs Something I should have said also is that here we only look at the uh, interactions across the two proteins. So I ranges in the first one, and J ranges in the second one. Okay. So once we have these interaction energies, we use them in order to make predictions. And let me show you how we do this. So here you have a matrix of interaction energies between kinases and response regulators, so two families of proteins, real families of proteins from uh, a lab strain of E. coli, so uh, lab bacteria. Uh, it happens to have 14 of proteins A and 14 proteins B uh, of the right type. And uh, we know, in this case, which one interacts with which one. And the numbering is according to the interaction. So the diagonal contains the actually interacting pairs. Here, we have used a training set, which is quite large. And so the predictions are good. You see that the diagonal is red, which corresponds to the lowest energy. So in practice, how do, you, do we make the predictions? We take the, the one with the lowest energy out of all the matrix, and we say, OK, this is the most likely pair. And then 
if the interactions are one to one, we can eliminate these two proteins from further consideration and move on. We can also use a global assignment uh, solution to the problem, and it, it works quite similarly. Um, OK, and uh, here I'm going to show you another representation of the same data. So these are the effective interaction energies between all the same pairs, except that here for each protein of type B, we write um, a little um, line for the level of its interaction for each of the proteins of type A. So each, level of in if, if each energy level corresponds to one pair. And uh, in red, you have the best candidates. In blue, you have the next ones. Uh, what we are going to use as a measure of our confidence score is the gap of energy, which is the distance between the best match and the next best match. The idea behind is that if we were to change a little bit the data set to remove some sequences or, or to add some sequences, all the energy levels would shift a little bit. And if the gap is small, they could shift so much that it would invert. Like, you know, so if we have a large gap, it's going to be more robust to small changes in the data. So we assume that this gap gives us uh, a confidence score in our pairing. And we are going to pick out of all the matches that we make, we are going to pick those which have the highest gap and to include them into the concatenated alignment at the next step. And then to rebuild the model from this longer alignment with more information. And hopefully this new model is going to make better predictions. And the hope is that by iterating, we get better, better performance. So overall, we make an approximation in this uh, um, iterative algorithm that approximately minimizes the interaction energy between the partners. Uh, I should say also that there is an al alternative approach that has been developed um, almost at the same time as ours, which relies on the same type of model. Um, and the idea uh, is to also approximately minimize this interaction energy. So now, let me show you how this uh, method performs on real data. So this is real data from bacterial proteins. And here I'm showing you the fraction of um, predictions of interaction, so pairs A, B, that are correct versus the number of uh, pairs in the concatenated alignment, which again grows at each iteration. So this is a bit, you know, in x-axis, it's a bit like uh, the number of iterations. What you see is that the curves are increasing, which is good. It means that as we iterate, performance becomes better. Uh, you see also this dashed line, which shows the chance expectation. It's what we would obtain if we would uh, match each protein A with a protein B randomly within each species. Uh, expectation of here 9%, which is pretty bad. Um, and here you can see like each color corresponds to a different size of the training set. You can see that it's much better to have large training sets than small training sets, especially at the beginning of the process. Here, if you have a very large training set, like 2,000 out of 5,000, you already have a very good model when you start. And then the improvement by iterating is very small. However, it's more interesting to look wha at what happens for small training sets, even the very small ones here. You will start with very poor performance because your model doesn't learn the correlations properly from sm such a small training set. But then, by iterating, the model improves, and you get better and better performance. You don't get as good as here because you learn some mistakes at some point, but it still gets pretty good by the end of the iterative process, which is here the point where all the pairs are in the concatenated alignment. Um, to sum up these results, you can also see this plot, which is the fraction of corrected, correctly predicted pairs versus the size of the training sets. Uh, in blue, you have what you obtain without any iteration. It means that without any iteration, you really need to have a pretty large training set to learn properly the model, like a few hundreds or a thousand. But with, with uh, the iterative process, you are able to gain a lot of performance, especially for the very small training sets. And in fact, you see that the red curve is almost flat and no longer depends too much on the size of your training set. Um, and um, here, we actually get good performance, like 84%, with one pair at the beginning. You realize that one pair is a terrible training set. Like with one pair, we don't know anything about correlations, basically. So it means that we can even make predictions without a training set. So we did this, and uh, we have to start the model somewhere without a training set. So here, you, you know, usually I say, OK, we start from a training set. So now if we don't have a training set, 
we start from random matches, which is going to be a terrible training set, of course, because you know, only 9% of the things are going to be correct. But nevertheless, if, if we start with this very bad training set, the performance increases as we iterate. Uh, here, the different <coughs> curves correspond to different iteration uh, step, uh, sorry, increment step, which are the number of sequences we add at each iteration. Um, you see that it's better to have small increments, which is again an argument in favor of the iterative process. And here you see the final fraction of correct pairs versus this increment step. And you see that you know, for small increments, starting without any training sets, we reach again 84% uh, of true positives. So the, the, the model is able to bootstrap its way towards high predictivity. Um, of course, at this point, you may want to know how it works and why we can get high predictivity starting from this bad training set. Yes, question? I'm trying to understand here on the left. Yes. You start from a random pairing. Yes, indeed. No. You, you don't want to learn from the mm -hmm. given. Exactly, I assume that I know okay. nothing. And now what you change mm -hmm. is the number of pairs you add. Yes, each. indeed. No. That's it, exactly. So exactly. But do you average out? Do you repeat the experiment more than once? Oh, because yeah, what's I mean going to happen is mm -hmm. if if you happen to learn from your random set something really wrong, you mm -hmm. add the sequence and you're going to start trusting it. What you add is going to influence the rest of your You are completely right. So this is this is indeed a concern. So you can indeed in this process you can learn wrong things. But so since then we have worked more about the question of why it works from su such a su training set. I should say first that we uh, allow re relearning the training set, which means that initially we make this terrible model out of the random matches, and we say, okay, the pairs which have the highest gap and the lowest energy, we assume that they are more correct than the others. But then at the next iteration, we um, don't necessarily keep the same uh, guys in the concatenated alignment. We allow relearning, so we can get rid of something, right? This is one of the things, one of the arguments, but it's not sufficient. You, I mean, there is still this question of why performance systematically increases. And uh, the, the answer is that, in fact, first, signal tends to add in a better, in a more constructive way than noise here. This is something that we, we now have some proof on synthetic data, which is very controlled, uh, signal adds linearly on no noise adds in square root of n, basically, like as you would expect, uh, basically. And so this is something that favors the correct pairs. This is one argument. But there is another one which is more intrinsic to the biological data set. It's that here, in fact, if you have uh, one correct pair in a given species, it's more likely to have neighbors in terms of sequence similarity uh, in another species, like a s very similar pair, AB, in another species, that an incorrect pair, an incorrect pair which you know groups one protein A from a pathway and the protein B from another pathway is less likely to have a neighbor in another species because the species may not have the same pathways, the same two pathways. So because of this, the among the possible pairs within each species, we have a bias that favors the, the correct pairs just because they have more neighbors in terms of um, proximity of sequences and at the beginning of our iterative process, we favor the sequences that are similar. We can also favor them explicitly. In fact, that, uh, you know, there is another method that favors them explicitly, but this is another thing. Here, even this method, which relies on maximum entropy, initially, when it's a bad model, it relies on sequence similarity, basically. So signal adds better than noise, and we favor the similar sequences, which have a bias towards correct ones. And my second question yeah. is indirectly related to that. Sure. I'm assuming that when you put these two sequences together, mm -hmm. you assume or you know that A and B belong to the same species. Indeed, uh, yes. There's no reason. Is there a, a fundamental reason to do that? Because it's um. not because the protein A and the protein B prime uh -huh. from the two belong to a different species that these two proteins Okay, you are right about this, but if we, I mean, I would say, it, okay, it's like you, you are asking the question from, for instance, an experimental point of view, you say, okay, I take A from E. coli and B from human, and they may interact together. It may, you know, it may work, right? 
I'm, you know, here we want to find the pairs that actually interact together in nature, which is why we limit ourselves to within species pairs. We could ask the problem that you're, you know, the problem that you refer to. However, um, first of all, there would be a combinatorial explosion, which would be mu much worse than in our case because the number of possible pairs would be much larger. But the concept of combinatorial explosion can be seen as something negative, as something positive. We add a lot of data. Um, add the information well about homology uh, among the proteins um, to you add the information about homology. Sorry, I'm not really sure I... W what I mean is you, you, you add the fact that A could interact with B, B1, B2, yes. B3. Yes. And this B1, B2, B3 have a certain homology mm -hmm. between them. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and yeah. that's indirectly taken into account in your model. It's, it's, it's included well in UTCA in your computation of your energy. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the correlations are taken into account, so similarity is underlying this, I agree. So, but are you saying that if we were to take the all no, the I'm possible... I'm just trying to see if you could increase yeah. the data that you have from which you learn. Because you, you oh. seem to say the more, the, the more oh. sequence you have, yes, the indeed. better your model. Well, okay, and but you know, where do I get this? No, this is a good point. I agree with you, but I think what matters more is the total size of your of your data set, like you know the total number of sequences. If you were to add, I mean, okay, so I guess what you yeah, what you're saying that you could add other pairs, for right. instance, so same A but many many Bs. I think in principle this would be good if we had some good way to be sure of the pairs or to be. So you know, it's a trade-off between having. Um, having lots of examples and having good examples. Again, in, in synthetic data, now we know that the trade-off can be quantified in like square root of n versus n. So you know, depending on how, yeah. So I think it's a good point. It would depend on how much noise you add versus data. I am concerned that the combinatorial explosion means that you would add lots of noise. But again, it depends on how we can score it. So yeah, I mean, I would say interesting question. But for now. What we do is within the species because we know that you know the natural interactions are within the species, but it's possible you know it it should be possible to address the other problem. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. So okay. Here we have good performance without a training set. I explained you a bit why we have this. Now I, I will move on to another method which is very related, but which is based on mutual information, and here you recognize a very similar slide to before. Uh, it's again an iterative pairing algorithm, but this time it's based on mutual information. So once we have the training set, we build the concatenated alignment. Instead of using uh, the maximum entropy inference method here, we just uh, build some information theory based scores, which are pointwise mutual information. So I say pointwise because mutual information would be the sum of this uh, with the priority distribution of the pair. Okay, so the advantage of this one is that it can score a pair of two residues at two sites. And if we were to average it over many pairs, we would get the mutual information between these two sites I and J. Um, so we use these scores uh, in order to um, produce some pairing p scores for all possible pairs. And then again, we make the assignments uh, and we run by a, a form of gap, which is not exactly the same, but it's similar. And we do the iterative process. So here, instead of approximately minimizing the effective interaction energy, we approximately maximize the pairwise mutual information between the partners. It's very similar. Um, before I show you how this method performs, I should remind you about something that is known in the field uh, for the prediction of structures. For the prediction of structures, in fact, uh, the method uh, based on maximum entropy inference, di direct coupling analysis, is much better than mutual information at predicting structures. So this is um, like an example for, from this paper. Uh, you can see here some protein structures. So the ex experimental structure is in gray. In blue, you have the pairs for which um, mutual information predicts that they are in close contact. And in fact, they are not always in close contact. You can see this better on the contact map where you have a gray dot for each real contact from the experimental structure and a blue dot in the half of this matrix here, a blue dot for the predicted ones. You see that the blue 
has a not so good overlap with the gray ones. Here, you have the same kind of predictions, but from the coupling. So essentially here, what is in red is the set of pairs of uh, residues that have high couplings EIJs, where here they, ha they were the ones that have high mutual information. You see that this matches much better, the contact map, than the mutual information. Okay. So here, maximum entropy really enables to gain a lot of performance. So you may say, OK, so now why are we going back to mutual information for the prediction of partners? So I will say that it's a different question. Here, we want to have some local information about the contacts. And indirect correlation can um, you know, make some confusions between the things. You can confuse the direct and the di indirect ones. This should matter far less for a global question, such as which A interacts with which B. And indeed, it turns out that if we use this method, so the one with the mutual information score, it performs as well, and in fact, slightly better than the direct coupling analysis method. So here you see, in red, the mutual information method. In blue, the maximum entropy method. Um, this is, again, the predictions obtained without any training sets, fraction of correct pairs in a real set of uh, proteins. Um, and you see that red is very slightly above blue. But more importantly here, if I look at the impact of the total data set size, total number of pairs, um, for predictions without any training set, so de novo prediction, I see that mutual information is slightly less data thirsty than maximum entropy, which is probably in part because uh, it's, it asks for less manipulation of the data, you know, which is better when you have noisy data. Um, OK, so mutual information is slightly better for finite data sets. And um, I will not go into the details now because I don't have time, but we in fact also propose some potential signatures of the existence of interactions between two protein families in addition to addressing this question of which A interacts with which B. Um, OK, so um, to conclude on this, you know, this question of uh, mutual information versus maximum entropy, I would like to say that uh, here mutual information performs better than maximum entropy at predicting interaction partners but a maximum entropy predicts better at finding amino acid contacts. I told you already that the indirect correlations are less crucial uh, for the partner prediction issue than for the structure prediction issue. But there is another point, which is that mutual information just quantifies the statistical dependence between two random variables. So it's quite uh, you know, global and generic, and it's agnostic regarding the origin of this um, statistical dependence. Uh, so it doesn't uh, really, you know, it was not optimized in order to find the contacts or the couplings. And I think, in fact, that this may matter because uh, correlations in protein sequences may arise from optimization and contacts, which are the ones that um, direct coupling analysis and maximum entropy are really good at finding. But these correlations may also arise from phylogeny, that is to say from the evolutionary history of the proteins. And here I'm showing an example, you know, of how correlations can arise just from this history without any constraints. Um, yeah. And uh, so, you know, we have these two types of correlations, one from optimization and one from contingency. And both of them may have a role when we want to infer interaction partners, because interaction partners te tend to have a similar evolutionary history. And in fact, there are methods um, that rely on phylogeny in order to find partners. So now I'm going to um, address this point, uh, looking at the role of phylogenetic correlations. And in order to isolate phylogenetic correlations, what we did was looking at synthetic data, where we only have phylogeny. Because in real data, you always have a mix, right? You have phylogeny and you have constraints. So here, we, do, we looked at some very simple synthetic data, um, where we start from a random chain of binary variables you may think of spins. I mean, here it's 0, 1. But, you know. And um, we uh, duplicate these sequences and make random mutations. And we accept all mutations. We assume that there is no, you know, no energy that favors one given configuration over the other. We accept all mutations. We duplicate again, make mutations, etc. And so in the end, we have a set of sequences which you know, each of them is basically random. But they have correlations between each other because each branch is short. The number of mutations on each branch is small. So the sisters will be very similar, the cousins will be less similar, etc. And the question is now, if we use our methods on such a data set and we cut, you know, we cut blue on the red here, 
Can we find the partners or not? And it turned out that yes, we can find the partners, and perhaps more surprisingly, we can find them even with the direct coupling analysis method. Um, so here I'm showing you like the direct coupling analysis method, so maximum entropy. We um, took a training set and a testing set. We learned the couplings from the training set, and we calculated uh, the effective interaction energies between all A's and all B's, which are the blue and red halves of my proteins. Um, and uh, we, we, okay, we use the same formula as before. And here you can see in this matrix the results. The proteins here are the A's and the B's, and they are ordered in the order of the phylogenetic tree. You can see here a structure of the matrix in blocks and sub-blocks. The sub-blocks are blue, which are the low effective interaction energies, etc. Uh, so it means that if you are very close in phylogeny, you have a small effective interaction energy. So it means that, in fact, the maximum entropy model captures the correlations from the phylogeny. And in fact, it's because this model is devised to reproduce the correlation. So it also reproduces these correlations, even though they are not from the post-model type, equilibrium post-model type uh, nature. Um, and so we can make predictions using this uh, model. In fact, we have uh, played the game of, uh, you know, trying to find interaction partners without a training set, etc. And it actually works pretty well. Uh, here you can see the performance. Okay, so we get high performances. We also compared the performance of this method, so DCI, to uh, a method that is explicitly based on sequence similarity and phylogeny, and that already exists in the bioinformatics literature. Uh, but we adapted it to our problem, so it's the mirror tree method. And we find that, uh, so okay, in the case I show you, so mirror tree is slightly performing better than DCA. Depends on the parameters. In fact, I haven't put the full uh, comparison here. Um, but the idea is that both of them perform quite well, and that uh, the information from phylogeny can be useful, in fact, to infer this partner. So here I'm showing this in a data set which has only phylogeny. But in real data, we can exploit, in principle, phylogeny and contacts. So this is something that is still, you know, something that there is work to do. But uh, uh, it gives you an idea that phylogenic, phylogenetic correlations can suffice to infer partners from sequences. And so now, um, I will shift to a slightly different problem, which is no longer inferring which proteins interact together from sequence data but instead it's uh, understanding uh, the collective modes of correlations in sequence data, so for one given protein. Um, this is motivated by uh, this paper here, which introduced the notion of sectors. Um, so the sectors are sets of amino acids that are correlated together. You can see here a matrix of correlations of one alignment of proteins, um, and in red you have high correlations, in blue, low correlations. In fact, this, uh, these elements are covariances, but weighted by conservation. It means that the red ones are the ones with high covariance, but also high conservation, so conserved covariance. Um, on the right, you have a cleaned version of this matrix, where you focus on the three top eigenmodes. In fact, OK, not the first, like the second, third, and fourth eigenmodes of the matrix, so those with the largest eigenvalues, and you look for the sites that contribute the most to, this, to these eigenmodes, eigenvectors, and then you reorder them. And so you, okay, these are the, s the set of sites that contribute most to the top uh, eigenvector and the next one, etc. And you see that you have these blocks, and in, this, in each of these blocks you have amino acids that seem to be collectively correlated together. And um, it turns out that in this paper, they have looked also at the position in 3D of these amino acids that are collectively correlated, and they found that they are connected in 3D, which was not obvious a priori. So it's a finding. And in addition, when you do mutagenesis experiments, you find that um, these sectors have um, a functional um, meaning, like you know, if you mutate a set of amino acids in this sector, you will have something that matters for the catalytic specificity of these enzymes, so how they recognize the substrate. Um, if you mutate some residues in the third one, you will change whether they are catalytic or not. But I should say that the second one, in fact, 
has rather a phylogenetic in interpretation, which again com comes back to the interplay between these two types of correlations. Okay, so based on these um, results, we wanted to ask what is the origin of the sectors and to propose um, a method to identify them in a principled way. And um, for this, we used a simple model which is based on an additive trait. So, okay, a trait is a property of a protein. It's quite abstract for now. It's any property that is interesting. We make a strong assumption on this property is that it is additive. So each site contributes additively to the property. Of course, this is, you know, bold assumption. Uh, it turns out that um, thermal stability is almost additive, almost, there are some sites that are not. And that um, recently it has been shown in this paper that uh, if you use a model of nonlinear selection on additive traits, it reproduces pretty well high throughput data. So, you know, this linear trait may be an interesting model, and at least it's simple. So we take this uh, linear trait model and we assume that the sector is a set of sites which have a high mutational effect, so high delta, on a trait under selection. And uh, because this trait is very abstract, we also introduced uh, a concrete example of a trait, which is based on the coarse grain elastic network model of a protein. So this is uh, the protein we worked on, the PDZ domain. Uh, we built um, an elastic model that gives the position of the alpha and beta carbon, and that puts springs between the closed ones. It's based on a very you know, well-known class of models, of elastic network models of proteins, which are able to reproduce some very important pro properties of the proteins. Um, and we added a sequence dependence in this model. We say that we have wild type amino acids and we may have mutations. And we assume that a mutation decreases the stiffness of the spring. So this is an assumption just to, to make a simple model of the effect of a mutation. Um, and then we can calculate the energy of deformation associated to small deformations within this elastic network and make a first order perturbation analysis in the variation of this deformation energy upon mutations. And if we work uh, at the first order, we have a linear thing, and so it looks like a linear trait at this order. So this is just an example of a concrete property that may lead to an additive trait in some regimes. And now we take this uh, idea of the linear trait and we perform a nonlinear selection on this linear trait, this additive trait. So we assume that evolution has favored one particular value of the trait. So in black, you have the histogram of the traits for random sequences of zeros and ones with as many zeros as ones. And uh, in orange, you have the ones that we will select. So these are the ones that have a, a trait close to a given value. We assume that this value is favored by natural selection for some reason. And so we assume that the fitness of the sequences is a quadratic function of the distance between the traits and its ideal value, delta E star. And uh, we, we, take, uh, we select the um, sequences uh, based on the Gaussian distribution. Um, and so uh, what we get then is uh, a set of sequences that have passed the selection. And now we ask the problem, can we learn about the selection process just from these sequences? So we take the sequences and we look at the covariance matrix inspired by the previous works. And we look at the eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition, and it turns out that we have a strong outlier in the smallest eigenvalue, not the largest, the smallest. Okay. So then we look at the associated eigenvector, which is called nu L here, and you can see here its components on all the sites. And below, in blue, you have the components of the trait, the mutational effects on of the trait delta that we have used in order to to produce the the data, and you can see that the components of the vector look very much like the delta. So it means that here, in fact, this eigenvector associated to the bottom eigenvalue gives us all the information about the trait that we have selected on. So for now, this is just a finding, but uh, we can understand it by looking back at what we did to the data. We selected those sequences such that the scalar product of the sequence with the trait vector are approximately equal to this ideal value of the traits. If we now look at this in an abstract space of sequences, it means that we have chosen the sequences that have a fixed projection on the axis delta, and so they are around a plane that is perpendicular to delta. And because of this, they have very small variance in the direction delta. 
and larger variance in the other directions. And delta indeed corresponds to this eigenvalue, which is the smallest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix, so associated to the lowest variance. So that's you know, a geometric interpretation of the result. In fact, more formally, delta is uh, a repulsive pattern in a generalized Hopf field model. Uh, so it's similar to the model introduced in these papers here. So OK, so we have found a way of um, getting the information on the traits and on the sector from the sequences. And uh, there is something that we worried about, is that here we rely on this smallest eigenvalue. It may be affected strongly by noise, by other small variance directions. And one example where it might be you know, impacted by other small variance directions is when there is strong conservation. So if, if, a, if a site is completely conserved, you will have no variance on this site. And that is what we find here. We have like, um, an example where we select at the tail of the distribution, and we have a very strongly conserved site. And this gives us uh, an, a bottom eigenvalue with an eigenvector that is essentially localized on this site. So we lose the information about the sector because of this. Uh, in order to get rid of this problem, we introduced a, a method that relies on the inverse covariance and that sets the diagonal to zero. The idea, in fact, is to use uh, the arguments from direct coupling analysis and maximum entropy that the inverse covariance matrix gives you the, an approximation of the couplings. And here, the couplings, they are, in fact, uh, the tensor pro okay, sorry, the outer product of delta with, with itself. So in fact, if you get rid of the diagonal, which contains conservation, you will get elements that are those of the outer product. And indeed, uh, if, you if you look for the top eigenvalue of this inverse covariance matrix without a diagonal, its eigenvector corresponds to delta pretty well. So this method enables you to get rid of, it of, uh, of um, sorry, conservation. Um, and we have also tested robustness to different types of selection. I will go fast on this because it's just you know, to show that it's not restricted to this Gaussian distribution. Uh, and finally, we have started applying this to real data. So this is an application to real PDZ sequences. Uh, we have compared the performance of our method to the one uh, that was introduced in the previous paper by the group of Ramarang and Athen that I cited uh, before. And it turns out that for this example, um, th so the aim is to predict the sites that are known to have important mutational effects in actual experiments. And um, we have a similar performance. So at 20 sites, we have a better one, and this is what is usually taken. But initially, this other method performed better. So it's kind of similar. And uh, I would say that this result is encouraging and that we should you know, look at more data. Um, now, I will just summarize my talk. I will say that uh, sequence covariation can inform us a lot about protein. It can tell us about the structure of a protein. It can tell us about protein-protein interactions. It can tell us about sectors of collective decorated amino acids that may inform us about selection on the traits. And um, we have methods to predict protein-protein interaction from sequences without a training set. And we have shown also that selection on a relevant physical property of a protein gives rise to a sector of collectively correlated amino acids. So this work is not finished at all. I mean, I think it opens some possible uh, areas, for instance, predicting new protein-protein interactions, uh, improving the prediction of complex st uh, structure, because now we can incorporate the predicted pairs that can be themselves used to infer structure. Um, and uh, I would say that from a more fundamental point of view, I am interested in understanding how optimization on, one, on the one hand and historical contingency on the other hand shape protein sequences and to exploit contacts and phylogeny at the same time to improve protein-protein interaction prediction. And uh, also, I'm interested in making sense of these collective correlations in protein sequences. So I would like finally to thank all my co-workers on this project. So I started working on this when I was a postdoc at Princeton University, so at the very end of my postdoc. Uh, my advisor was Ned Wingreen, and we started working on this together. We uh, had a collaboration with Lucy Caldwell at Cambridge University. Uh, Rob Dwyer uh, was a student with Ned at Princeton. Now I also have a collaboration with Martin Weicht at Sorbonne University. Together with Martin, we advised a master student, Guillaume Marmier, who did some great work. And um, on the sector part, I, I continued working with Ned. And uh, together, we advised Xu Wen Wang, who was visiting at Princeton and uh, is now a postdoc in Harvard. 
I should also thank uh, Mohamed Baraka and Philippe Orte from Sierra Cadarache because they have a great database of uh, sequences of uh, kinases and response regulators, which was very useful um, for the application to real data. I also thank Claude Loverdo and Raphael Voiturier, my colleagues from the theory group of Laboratoire Jean Perrin, for great discussions. And also the Aspen Center for Physics uh, for great discussions in summer with Ned and other colleagues. If you would like to know more about this, uh, these are the references uh, about this work. And so now I should thank you for your attention. And I would like to say that if you have junior colleagues uh, that are interested in finding a PhD or a postdoc, I would have some openings uh, starting from February 2020. I'm actually moving to EPFL in Switzerland and uh, we'll be recruiting on these uh, topics at the scale of proteins and also e on evolution at the scale of microbial populations, also related to optimization versus historical contingency. So finally, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>